All right, um, lecture six, and uh, we are going to discuss another one-dimensional toy model uh, of solid state, and uh, this time, this one will have to do with electrons. So conduction, uh, or even some more advanced properties like why some materials are electrical insulators and why some are conductors can be already seen in this very simple model. It's called a tight binding model for reasons that I might highlight later on, but just remember these are very frequently used uh, terms, tight binding. Okay, actually the model is uh, in some ways similar to what we uh, discussed last time, so as a recap, we had this one-dimensional chain of atoms connected by springs, and we were looking at vibrations, right? And what we were able to calculate is uh, the dispersion relation of the normal modes of vibration in such a one-dimensional chain of masses connected by springs or atoms connected by interatomic forces. Um, and it looked like this. So it is some kind of dependence of omega, which is the mode frequency, uh, dependence on k. And where did this k come from? That came from the fact that we used this ansatz, this plane wave uh, equation, as an ansatz for the solutions of our model. So we assume that the solutions are this, and we found that indeed this function fits. Uh, and this function uh, uh, describes a wave with k vector k and frequency omega. Right? And the model gives you the relation between those two. This is the functional form of that dispersion relation that we found. OK, so today our model will be in some ways similar. There will still be atoms at a distance A, so a unit cell in this case will be something like this. Uh, and so we can reproduce this structure by repeating the unit cell as long as we need to. However, we will be focused on electrons living around these atoms, right? And we remember from chemistry, or you can read it in your textbook, chapter 5, how electrons um, live around atoms and molecules, they occupy orbitals. And uh, when atoms are arranged in a crystal, individual atomic orbitals from each atom have a little bit of overlap. So those orbitals, which are the eigenstates of electrons in a single atom, couple. And like we uh, saw also in the homework, for example, when two states are close together, they couple. and uh, you can tunnel between them or their energies become renormalized by this coupling. So these are the things we're going to look at today, but we're not going to have a molecule with just two of these atoms. That would be the simplest elementary case and very important for the understanding, but we're going to have a whole chain of n atoms and see what happens uh, in that case. So it turns out also very easy to solve when it's a very large number of atoms. So it's easy to solve one, two, and many, right? like many things in physics. Those are the easy things to solve. And so we are going to explicitly solve uh, this model today. So complete, uh, completely analytically solve it. And like I said, um, it reproduces a lot of the important features of electrons and solids uh, already in this very simple model. And we are going to then, uh, in, a, in a week or so, uh, introduce a more complete model that accounts for the details of the crystal structure, right? This is a, just a one-dimensional chain, but in 3D you can have different arrangements of atoms, and so different uh, transitions of electrons between those atoms. Um, and that, that brings in some more um, deeper features, uh, but already some important things like uh, band structure, we can already demonstrate today, and that's very exciting. Uh, just to give you a very simple picture to keep in mind, 
so this is hold a tight binding model, but what happens in this model is electron hopping. So you can imagine that uh, you take electrons uh, attached to atoms, you put the atoms together, and uh, in the initial moment of time, electron is on its own atom that it came with into the crystal. But then, because of coupling of orbitals, uh, electron starts to jump from one atom to the other, and each of these hopping events is uh, as probable as strong is the coupling between the atoms. Uh, so uh, the uh, crystal structure comes in to, this, to the frequency of this hopping. So this is a, um, a very uh, simplified picture of what a tight binding model accounts for. Uh, this is a more rigorous uh, uh, description of it, and you will see from this description that uh, while um, individual terms in our final Hamiltonian look like hopping from one orbital to the other, what we are actually going to solve is a time independent, so this will be a sta uh, steady state Schrodinger equation, sorry, uh, time independent Schrodinger equation uh, spectrum of the whole system. So we will find an energy spectrum of n electrons on n atoms. This is what we're going to find. So electrons are allowed to be everywhere. Uh, and uh, this hopping event, I'll show you how it comes into this picture. But we are going to solve for the eigenenergies of the entire system, much like we solved for normal modes of vibration for the entire chain of vibrating atoms. Now we're going to find eigenstates of electrons in a chain of um, stationary atoms in this, time, in this case. All right, so um, in this uh, lecture, we are going to uh, simplify these atoms uh, or consider the simplest atoms where we only need to concern ourselves with a single orbital per atom. Each atom has one orbital. Let's say it's the highest unoccupied orbital. Maybe it's an S orbital of a sodium atom. Um, and um, we are going to label these orbitals just 1, 2, 3, N uh, with uh, cats uh, like this. These are the labels of the orbitals. So each atom has a single orbital. Um, and we are going to make uh, some uh, further approximations to deal with these orbitals in a simple way. First of all, we are going to say that all these orbitals are orthogonal, right? Quantum mechanically orthogonal. Um, this is, does not have to be the case. Uh, there is some overlap between these wave functions, right? And therefore, they should not be orthogonal. They are only really orthogonal when atoms are really, really, really far away from each other. Then we can say that all these orbitals are orthogonal. However, uh, it doesn't change much in the final calculation uh, to assume that they're orthogonal, and it makes things much, much easier to calculate, as you can imagine. So this is an approximation. This is also a very important picture to have in mind. So you uh, really imagine hopping of an electron from one orbital to the other, uh, from one orthogonal orbital to the next. So they form an orthogonal set. And this is expressed by this bracket equation that the matrix element between nth orbital and mth orbital uh, is 1 when n is equal to m and 0 otherwise. Okay. So the Kronecker delta function here. Okay. Um, and so um, the general form of the wave function that can be a solution of um, our Hamiltonian, which is these uh, coupled atoms, is a superposition of these orbital states. Which, what does it mean? It means that the electron can be split between these orbital states. So it can be partially on the first atom, partially on the seventh atom, partially on the n minus first atom. This is what uh, this equation means here. So we are going to look for solutions to our model in the basis of 
atomic orbitals. And therefore, oftentimes, the one-dimensional tight binding chain model, that's the name of the lecture today, is also referred to as a model of linear combinations of atomic orbitals, LCAO. So those are, this is the same thing. And this is where it comes from. So atomic orbitals are assumed to be orthogonal and solutions for electrons are just linear combinations of different atomic orbitals. Okay, so this is a setup. This is a setup for our, uh, for dissecting our Hamiltonian and ultimately for finding solutions. It will go a little bit abstract, right? Uh, we will have to solve a Hamiltonian to find some trial wave function and so on, but this is where it all comes from. This is just a linear combination of individual atomic orbitals. Uh, you can make this more complicated. For example, you can say, well, each atom has two available orbitals. Right? And uh, then you'll just have more terms in this, in this sum, uh, and, but maybe your model will be uh, more accurate for a, certain, uh, for a certain solid that you want to solve. Okay? So this model can be easily expandable, and that's also a great feature. Uh, of this tight binding or LCAO model. Okay, so now we need to um, solve the Schrodinger equation. Time independent for this lecture, but uh, it can also be time dependent. You can also look at dynamics of uh, electronic states uh, in a tight binding system. Uh, so you can study how wave packets really travel through uh, the system, uh, but for now, like I said, we are going to look for the spectrum. So we are going to look essentially for these E, for these eigenstates, for these uh, solutions of the Schrodinger equation. Um, it is convenient to uh, express the Hamiltonian on the left-hand side here, uh, just in the basis of the same orbitals uh, in this form. Uh, Hamiltonian is a matrix. Are you familiar with this uh, representation of a Hamiltonian? Everybody? No? Uh, so um, if you know that uh, you only have this basis of wave functions you're dealing with, these uh, phi, which are split into C and N, you can fully describe the Hamiltonian by specifying all of these matrix elements. And so... Um, if you knew all of these matrix elements, uh, basically you know transitions between all possible n states. Uh, you can go from the first state to the nth state. You can go from n to n plus 1. And you also know what happens if you stay on one atom. If you put, let's say, something like 3H3, this will give you the amplitude of staying on one atom. And so just in terms of this chain, you can see that a full set of these matrix elements fully describes whatever can happen here. You can go from any atom to any atom, or you can stay on the same atom. And then the Hamiltonian is just a matrix. It is a large matrix of dimension n with uh, these kind of terms, n, h, m, scattered all over the matrix and you multiply it by this kind of uh, vector and you get energy in terms of the same vector. So this uh, is basically what Schrodinger equation is when we plug in this kind of a wave function into here. All we need to know to fully describe the Schrodinger equation is this set of matrix elements. Then we can fully map out Schrodinger equation. So, of course, we can also write explicitly the operator for the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And this is how, what we would do to calculate these matrix elements. Right? So, we could do this way. We could say, okay, Hamiltonian is some kinetic energy plus some potential energy. Um, and then we can 
take uh, sorry s too too close to the edge of the screen we could take n h m and that would be the integral over the entire space of the wave function h psi star right and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the entire space and then we would find these matrix elements but if we know them somehow by this calculation or somebody gives them to us then we can just write down this matrix um, and that will fully describe the Hamiltonian okay so this is the wave function and this is uh, our Schrodinger equation so in terms of this H and M. Now, I am not going to calculate these H and M by taking the integral over the entire space. I'm going to make some very simple and common sense assumptions that will go into my model. The assumption is here. If N is equal to M, then the matrix element, one element in that big matrix, uh, is just some constant epsilon naught. What is the meaning of epsilon naught? It's just the energy to stay on one side, right? To occupy one orbital. So that's the atomic orbital energy. So since these are orthogonal orbitals, they're the same as the orbitals of an isolated atom, that's basically the energy to occupy that energy level in an atom all of the terms, all of the complex calculations that might go into actually calculating what that energy is, I just represent by this one number, epsilon naught. And now since all of my atoms are the same, epsilon naught is independent of the site of what n is or what m is. Epsilon naught is just a constant, the same for all the atoms. Okay? And that's the internal energy inside the atom. Now, these two uh, uh, lines, the second and the third line in the uh, bracket, this require a little bit uh, longer discussion. Um, so uh, the way the wave function is represented here by me, I gave you first the impression that uh, atoms can, take, uh, can live on all orbitals, uh, uh, electrons can live on all orbitals and that will ultimately be the case so they will find waves that occupy the entire system to be the solutions however if you think about uh, an electron as a quasi classical particle as a little ball um, and you imagine him uh, confined to one orbital then uh, it is not likely uh, quantum mechanically that that ball will start from one side, uh, let's say this side number five, and just uh, tunnel, hop, into site number 500. This is just very difficult to imagine. So uh, you could include such terms, but the amplitude, the probability of such transitions, so transitions very far along the lattice, will be very small. And therefore, uh, the most probable ones are when it just hops by one. And so for this model, for today, we are only going to make those relevant by saying that the matrix element is finite, it has this value minus j, only if the difference between n and m is 1. So if you uh, reduce n by 1 or uh, increase n by 1. So if you tunnel one side over, if you hop by one side. So that's the meaning. And all the other matrix elements are zero. So now the matrix, this Hamiltonian uh, matrix representation of the Hamiltonian looks uh, actually not so complicated. Uh, diagonal is all epsilon nodes, right? N equal to M is all epsilon nodes. Of diagonal are all j or minus j uh, you know, don't hold me 
don't pay too close attention to these plus or minus signs. I uh, easily get them wrong, but this is something like J. And everything else farther away from the second diagonal is zero. These describe far, uh, transitions that are farther away. So this is, this is the Hamiltonian that we are going to solve today. OK, so we could <clears throat> diagonalize this matrix. Turns out it's actually, well, you, we could do that. Uh, but we are going to use what we already used last time and use an ansatz. So we're going to suppose what this wave function actually looks like. Right? We will make a guess. Since we've already done it before, this is very natural. It's a very natural thing for us to do. <coughs> OK. But first, let's, let's write out this equation in a, in a mathematical term. Uh, so I drew a matrix for you. Uh, let's write it in a, in, a, in a line now. So to combine these three in one expression, we use this. So it is a formula that has these three cases all included. Basically, you have if n is equal to m, you have this epsilon naught term thanks to this delta. Uh, now, if n and m are e different by plus 1 or minus 1, you have a minus j term. So this is the only one of these possibilities is true at a given time. And so for a given n and a given m, you will have to refer to, to this and see uh, whether one of these is true or whether you have to put 0. None of these are true. So this is just rewriting this in this form. So you can see that the meaning of j is the strength of hopping by 1. And the meaning of Epsilon naught is the energy to stay on one, on one side. So a little bit like potential and kinetic energy, but in this toy, toy representation, or paramet parametrized representation, parametrized by just two numbers, j and epsilon naught. OK, so we plug in uh, this expression into the Schrodinger equation, uh, and we get the following. This, is a uh, this equation can break down into a set of equations. For each n, basically, you will get one equation. Because uh, there are many terms that are 0. Uh, because for higher m, we have uh, terms in this sum are 0. So uh, for each n, you're going to have this kind of an equation. So just plug in some n here and evaluate these delta functions. Uh, and we're going to have that for 1n, you have epsilon naught to stay on one side. And you also coupled to the, wave, the amplitudes of the wave function for the adjacent orbitals c and minus 1 and c and plus 1. Remember, c are the amplitudes here, I did not highlight them before, but this is, this is what they are here. OK, so we need to solve these equations. And we are going to use this ansatz method. So we're going to look at it very deeply and say, I think that the wave function that we have to use here is such and such. Actually, it's this wave function. And it should already be familiar to you. Because it's very similar to what we used before for phonons. It's an exponential uh, with a complex argument. <coughs> now, uh, this function does not have this uh, i omega t term. Uh, that's simply because we are solving time independent. Schrodinger equation. So if we were solving a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, then uh, it would really look the same as for phonons uh, last time. Now it's time-independent. 
We have a normalization uh, that is necessary because we have n orbitals. So there is the square root of n. Um, otherwise, uh, many, many of the same ideas as we already developed for phonons will naturally apply here, right? Because the wave function is so similar. Uh, so all the ideas about k vector being periodic with a 2 pi over a period, for example, uh, are still valid here. Uh, so we will see that you can define a Brillouin zone. Uh, uh, you will see that we can derive a dispersion relation and so on. So uh, they should feel very comfortable with it based on the previous lecture, uh, solving this equation with this trial wave function, ansatz. So we just plug it in. Uh, remember, our Schrodinger equation became this after substituting the assumptions of the model. So after expressing it in terms of this basis of uh, uh, orthogonal orbitals and uh, making assumptions about matrix elements that uh, you can only hop by one or stay on one side. Uh, otherwise, the probability is zero. And now we plug in these coefficients into here. And what we get is a bunch of exponentials. Uh, the difference between them is just the argument here is n times a. Here it's n minus 1 times a. Here it's n plus 1 times a. So uh, let's take e to the i k and a out of the uh, brackets and cancel it. What do we have left? What we have left looks like a cosine. This is a cosine. Actually, we did not need to assume that these functions are real for the electrons. That's also a difference with uh, phonons. But energy is, of course, real. And uh, you know, it's really easy to solve this. Just uh, two lines of calculations. And what do we have here? Energy as a function of momentum is a cosine function. So this is the dispersion relation. For the one dimensional tight binding model, um, energy is the same as frequency. That's a relevant concept here. What does this uh, depend upon? All the parameters of the model that we put in. So energy to stay on site, probability to hop, and to set the correct scale for k for this uh, uh, momentum, for this wave vector, it, we uh, use a. So the interatomic distance comes in there. That's, that's why we use this trial wave function to uh, set the right magnitude of k. Because we are going to be ultimately relating this to a real crystal size. So a will be the real interatomic spacing. And if we want to know the correct value for k, k units of k are 1 over uh, meter. Uh, we need to put the correct scale here. And the scale here is a distance from one side to the other. So this is how A comes in uh, to this. And this is why we put A in the uh, assumption here. So the wave function has to be periodic uh, with the uh, period of the lattice. OK. So we're done solving this. That's it. It's pretty easy uh, for this one-dimensional case uh, in, of a very, very simplified uh, model. So the rest of the lecture will be essentially focused on discussing of the meaning of this solution. So first of all, I plot for you this cosine function, which is the dispersion relation of a 1D tight binding model. 
a plot of this function that we just derived. Um, and uh, let's start with some uh, definitions. Um, so first of all, it's a single valued function. So the solution is just this one function. So we have one energy for one k. Um, and one such solution, one such branch is called a band. So this is a single band. It's called band because uh, uh, in the range of energies where this solution lives, for any energy we have some k, some momentum k, uh, uh, that gives us an, uh, that is related to this energy. So we pick any energy and there will be a momentum k uh, right here or very close to that location. So there are no big gaps inside this band. This band is uh, continuous. Uh, so inside the band, uh, we have uh, 1k for each energy. Um, OK, um, it is a periodic function. And its period is 2 pi divided by a much like it was for the phonons. Um, and so this is also called the brillion zone uh, in this case. Uh, so the range from minus pi a to pi a in this k is also called the brillion zone. Now, we solved for a single band. If we did something more complicated, for example, if we uh, allowed there to be two orbitals per atom, for example, if we said that uh, on each side we have one alpha and one beta, and then on the next side we can have two alpha and two beta, so we have two sets of orbitals per site. Uh, very generally, what we would find after we solve uh, the one dimensional tight binding model in that case is more than one branch in the solution. So for each of these alpha and beta, there'll be a branch. Yeah? Is it yeah? Well, I think you can just represent it as uh, uh, two matrices two two-dimensional matrices. But you could also write it in a three-dimensional form. There will be a lot of zeros in that representation. Right? If you remember uh, what we had for a diatomic chain for vibrations last time, we had just two sets of equations, one for delta x, one for delta y for the two atoms of the diatomic chain. Uh, the similar thing will happen here with alpha and beta. Uh, and uh, Okay, in this case, I'm plotting these bands uh, inverted like this uh, for a different arrangement. There, there could be uh, different solutions, but in general, now we can see what it would look like in a, with two bands. And in general, in solids, uh, we will have many, many bands. There will be typically only two bands relevant, two bands separated by a little uh, gap here. So uh, the other bands will be irrelevant for the reasons that I will uh, tell you uh, in a moment. OK. Um, still sticking with two bands. Um, we re redraw them in the extended zone scheme, right? So I took the band from the first brillion zone, and I flipped it over into the second brillion zone, which goes from minus pi a to minus 2 pi a, is from pi a to 2 pi a. Uh, and I'm allowed to do that uh, because these are all periodic functions, and uh, shifting everything by uh, 2 pi over a uh, does not change the solution uh, because all the coefficients c1, c2, c3, and so on go into themselves after we shift this by 2 pi over a. 
So I'm totally allowed to draw it like this. Uh, what I can see in this representation is that at the brillion zone boundaries, there are these discontinuities. And these are called band gaps. This is an extremely important concept. The fact that there are intervals of energy without any allowed states, right? So in this band, there are no states. There is a gap in the spectrum. Electrons are not allowed to have energy in this range. They are not allowed. There are no solutions for that. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, we will see how that leads to um, the concepts of insulators and uh, metals and semiconductors in the subsequent lectures and also starting today. Uh, now, there are also uh, gaps for phonons, right? Uh, if you remember from last time, uh, similar uh, concepts uh, apply for phonons where at the brillion zone boundaries there can be a discontinuity in a two, band, two uh, diatomic uh, chain. Uh, and uh, so you can also have an energy gap for phonons, just tends to have less of an impact on the overall understanding and so on. So they are also there. It's not just for electrons, just maybe less uh, gravitas in the overall. Uh, much more energy is spent studying these energy gaps for electrons than uh, those for phonons. Although there is some research on that as well. OK. <coughs> Now, what about the size of the gap? Uh, well, you can read it off from, sorry, size of the band. You can read off the size of the band from the scale in the tight binding model. The size of the gap is 4 times j. Just depends on j. Does not depend on anything else. Um, and uh, so, of course, uh, this already puts a lot of uh, meaning, extra meaning into J, right? So J, what was J? J was hopping from one atom to the other, probability of hopping. Uh, and now we see that uh, the width, the energy interval in which electrons are allowed to live just depends on this one parameter, J. So we could, for example, measure the band width, the width of the band. We could measure the band width, and then we could get this parameter j for our tight binding calculation of a solid directly from the measurement of the band width. Um, there is a uh, very uh, intuitive way to understand uh, why bands have widths, of course. I can tell you, well, we solved the tight binding model. We got this solution. And now we just see that uh, there, are, there is a bandwidth. But there is a simpler, uh, simple way to, to see it. And uh, we have to start from uh, isolated atoms. So this plot on the right shows you that um, the energy uh, to be on one atom when atoms are really, really far away, right? or if you just have one atom, uh, that is what we called epsilon naught in the beginning, right? So if uh, a chain was very, very stretched, A was large, atomic spacing was very large, then uh, the energy of each electron would just be epsilon naught, and they would all have the same energy. There would be n states for n orbitals. They would all have the same energy. And so you could still say, well, what is the width of the band of energies for this system. Well, when in an infinitely stretched one-dimensional chain, the width of that band will be zero. And all the energies will be the same number, just like for one single isolated atom. Now, what happens when atoms come closer together? Uh, we, here we have to remember uh, just a molecule, right? 
diatomic molecule, uh, like a hydrogen molecule, for example, and uh, think back to the concept of a covalent bond. Right? When we had two hydrogen atoms far apart, each would have an energy level given by the Rydberg constant and so on. Uh, when they come close together, the energy levels split. And they split by the exchange energy. They form bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. Uh, the point is, there are still two levels, just like for two isolated hydrogen atoms. But now, uh, these levels are split. Now, what tends to happen when you add more and more atoms is that the number of levels remains the same, but their density increases. Their separation might also change uh, as you bring them closer and closer together. And when you have really lots of atoms, they will form a band like that, and the characteristic spacing between the levels will be just given by J, or that's related to the spacing between atoms. So it will be given by the atomic spacing. So as the atomic spacing goes down, J increases. That's, that makes sense, right? So the, the closer the atoms are, the farther apart the energy levels in the molecule are. And the same is true for N atoms. So as we go farther and farther, the spacing becomes larger and larger between the energy levels. The number of levels remains the same. So we still have n electrons, n orbitals, and so we have n levels, always n levels. And so just like with phonons, if you think about these finite size effects that the chain actually has a fixed number of atoms, n atoms, uh, then we have to remember that in fact, not all Ks are allowed, but only Ks that satisfy some kind of boundary conditions. So the spacing between K points will be actually 2 pi over A divided by N. Those are the allowed points. However, in a real solid, like I said before, you have so many of these atoms that you cannot resolve the distance between the points and it becomes, for all practical purposes, a continuous band. So we will no longer discuss the fact that there are n levels, but it is uh, in there. Okay. So bandwidth. Band gap, now the shape of the band. Uh, it is a cosine function. And this is, by the way, different than what we had uh, last time because for phonons, for vibrations, we had a sine function. The difference comes from the fact that today we only had to take one derivative uh, in our uh, function. You didn't really see the derivative the way I, I wrote it out for you, but the Schrodinger equation had... Uh, one and here we had to take a second order derivative. So cosine became a sine. Uh, sounds like a vaguely obscure math difference. Tends to have fundamental implications here. A very different nature of the particles, which are the solutions of these equations, right? So remember what we had for phonons, we had a sine function which around 0 k in the middle of the Brillouin zone approximates by a straight line. So the dispersion relation is approximately linear and we could talk about sound. We could talk about these particles as sound waves propagating with a fixed velocity v. Now, here looks very different, right? This is a Cosine, so at the bottom, this approximates as a parabola. So if we only look at particles here at the bottom of the band, they live in a parabolic dispersion relation. Now, parabolic dispersion relation is not something unheard of. In fact, 
particles in free space have a parabolic dispersion relation, right? Described by this. This is the dispersion relation of an electron without any crystal. So we introduced all this hopping and all this um, atomic structure into the model. And what we get in the end is the same as for free particles, right? So that is uh, perhaps a little bizarre, or perhaps it is very convenient, right? So now we can think about the solutions of this model as just free particles, at least at some level, right? So indeed, we can just take, you know, we can approximate the cosine by this 1 minus k squared divided by 2. That's the Fourier expansion of the cosine around the 0. Uh, and plug it into the dispersion relation, we get something that has a constant in the front, but then has a quadratic, quadratic form. So uh, the intuition that you would have for free particles uh, would, to a large extent, apply to electrons in a band in a tight binding model, and would largely apply to real semiconductors, many of the real metals. They are free particles. They're, the potential disappeared as if it wasn't there. Not quite true, right? Because here we have this m is the real electron mass. This is the mass of an electron particles. So it's 10 to the minus 31 grams. That's the real mass of an electron. Here we have some j, a, some parameters, right? So this is, uh, in general, this uh, j times a does not have to be equal to the electron mass. And therefore, we uh, stumble upon another very important concept, the effective mass. So this is a M star, and the meaning of an M star should be clear now. Right? So M star is the effective mass, so it looks effectively like the mass, however, is not actually a mass of a real uh, free particle. But effectively, in the dispersion relation, which is a cosine close to 0 k for small k, behaves, plays a role of a mass. Effective mass plays a role of a mass. And so how do we find the effective mass? Well, we look at this, and we say that uh, this is proportional to, was equal to a constant, plus h squared, k squared, divided by 2m star. And so from this, we can find that m star is equal to h bar squared divided by 2j a squared. Okay? So again, effective mass has all the parameters uh, of the model here. Actually, it doesn't have epsilon naught. Epsilon naught plays a role of um, a relativistic uh, mass of uh, rest, right? Rest mass, mc squared. Um, However, it depends on j, it depends on a. Okay, so uh, at least a, we know what it is. We have ways to find out what a is for a particular crystal, right? For example, we can take a known amount of material, crystallize it, and we're going to know how many atoms are there, and we can measure its volume. And we can say, okay, there are so many atoms per unit volume, so the spacing between the atoms must be this. So we have at least this very simple way of measuring A, not to mention all the uh, X-ray techniques that we're going to talk about next week uh, that we have also at our disposal. So A is something that we can easily measure. J, on the other hand, is this parameter which we uh, ad hoc introduced into our model. This is a completely coming from a toy model. However, uh, we could measure J, for example, by knowing what is the band width, right? We could tell it from the bandwidth. Or we could maybe have other ways of calculating it or estimating it. And then we could calculate the effective mass. Um, so what does it mean? Well, it means that uh, these particles, these electrons on our chain, are going to behave like free particles, like in a Drude model. right? Like in a Drude model, except they're going to have a different mass. And this mass can be 
a hundred times smaller than the electron mass or several times larger. So for example, in a semiconductor I work with, indium antimonide, uh, the mass of an electron is 0 0.01 of the mass of an electron, I think even smaller. So it is, I think, more than a hundred times smaller than the mass of a real electron. And in uh, Jeremy Levy's lab, they have some electrons that are, I believe, three times heavier than uh, three electrons. So they can be heavier, they can be lighter. Uh, it comes from the, just uh, how uh, you know, steep this cosine function is in this calculation. And what we have to, which parabola we have to use to fit it. But it has uh, an intuitive meaning of the mass. Um, so remark here at the bottom of the slide that, uh, of course, when we talk about these as being free particles, uh, then uh, free particles have energy, they have momentum, right? And uh, the dispersion relation is periodic, uh, and so we have the same problem as we had with phonons that what do we set as momentum? Well, we uh, take the first brilliant zone, and if it pleases us to take K here. Uh, this does not have the meaning of momentum. We have to take it back to the first Boolean zone, so subtract several times the 2 pi divided by A from this K, and then the um, equivalent point in the first Boolean zone, the crystal momentum, has plays the role of the momentum of this particle of this effectively free particle with the effective mass, that would be its momentum. So K here would be in the first brilliant zone. Okay. Otherwise it does not have the same meaning. Otherwise we would run into problems for what to call the effective mass, whether we put K here or K plus 2 pi over A or K plus pi over A and so on. So we will have difficulty defining the effective mass. Okay, now another very, very important uh, concept is uh, what if we now include all the electrons that we have and put them all together in a band? We're going to see that uh, talking about filling of the bands uh, leads us to the concepts of insulator, conductor, semiconductor, and so on. So this is extremely important. So, so far I talked about just the solutions and their general properties, but we remember that these are fermions, and you can have one per fermion per quantum state, and therefore in the band you're going to start filling it like you fill a bucket. You're going to start filling it from the bottom, and you're going to go up and up and up until you reach some level. Uh, important remark is that per K you have two allowed states, spin up and spin down. These are fermions, so everything has to be multiplied by two. This is very important. Why is it important? As shown here, so um, this is the same band, so a single band uh, tight binding calculation solution, uh, which um, comes with n states. Remember, we counted the states and we said that there are n orbitals and n electrons, uh, so there has to be n allowed states. So n states uh, are starting from here and going down, 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 and leading all the way up to here, you have n states. Except at each of these points you have two. So the total is 2n. But you have n electrons because on each atom you have just one electron. So for example, if atoms have a valence of one, each atom would contribute one electron to the band structure, and uh, in a tight binding chain you have to think that each side donates one electron. So you have two n possibilities and you have n particles. This band will be half filled. One half of the states will be filled. So all the red here up to half of the band, so from minus 2j to 0, that's all going to be filled. All the states above 
are not going to be filled. And this is, of course, a zero temperature result. Remember Fermi statistics. So at higher and higher temperature, you're going to have, uh, you're going to create some vacancies below. You're going to have some vacancies here, and you're going to put some electrons here above right, by thermal excitation. So this boundary will stop being blurred. However, at zero temperature, uh, this level, so this point here and this point here, define the Fermi energy. So energy below which all states are filled, above which all states are empty. Uh, and they define a Fermi surface. So all the points with the Fermi energy define a Fermi surface. Here, it is a little bit silly to call it Fermi surface because this is a one-dimensional model and we have just two points. We have two Fermi points. We have Fermi momentum Kf and we have minus Kf. That's all. But in two dimensions, in three dimensions, that's going to become uh, a continuum shape, a Fermi line, Fermi circle in two dimensions, or a Fermi sphere, uh, Fermi surface in three dimensions. Now, because we uh, immediately above the Fermi level, we have a lot of states without any gap uh, that just uh, continue. So even at tiny, tiny temperature, we receive the ability to excite to these states. And so if we calculate the heat capacity here, we're going to see that this heat capacity is proportional to T, just like we did before right, in the Sommerfeld model. So the same ideas apply here, uh, and that's because there's no gap uh, above the Fermi level, and therefore, and at already at any, at any small temperature, there will already be some empty states below and some filled states above, and there will be a possibility for these particles to absorb thermal energy and to increase the total energy of the system, therefore have non-zero heat capacity, and we de uh, demonstrated before that that's proportional to T. So this model retains that feature. This model is also a metal. So a uh, half-filled band is the simplest model of a metal. This is how you get a metal. Why is that? Well, what is a metal? A metal is when you apply an electric field, you get current. Right? Electrons start to move. This is how it looks here. When you apply electric field in, uh, well, I guess it's in that direction because we have negative charges, uh, electrons start to move in that direction. And the way it looks is you take some states from this side and you kind of shift it to this side. And so on one side, you have now more states than on the other. Uh, what are these sides? Well, these are sides with negative momentum and positive momentum. So we can call this side forward moving, and these are backward. This word means backward. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we have backward and forward moving particles. Let me just show it like this. And so under the influence of the electric field, we're going to have more forward moving particles and less backward moving particles. What does it mean? There is going to be a net electrical current here. That's what it means. So in practice, you don't actually take states from here and hop them all the way there. You actually shift all the electrons by a little bit this way. They all get some momentum this way. Right? So they all get uh, shifted this way. It's just, uh, at the end of the day, it looks like if the uh, uh, electrons just hop from one side to the other. So this is how you get uh, a current. And half-filled band is an easy way to demonstrate uh, a metal. OK, what about a full band? 
How do you get a full band? Well, if your valence were 2, then you have 2n electrons in, for n atoms. And we have 2n states in one band. Right? So we still have one orbital per atom, but we have two electrons per atom. And therefore, all the states in the band are filled. This band is called uh, inert. Uh, this band uh, is a representation of an insulator. Why is it a representation of an insulator? Uh, it's because if you apply electric field, there is nowhere for the electrons to shift. There are no available states. You cannot create a situation in which more electrons are forward moving and uh, then backward moving. There is always the same number, so the net current is always zero. So the band is filled. There are actually waves living in the entire uh, chain here. The solutions are electrons in the entire chain, but you cannot create an electrical current here. You cannot. You also cannot give this band any heat. You cannot increase its energy because there are no states available to absorb that energy. There are no higher energy states that are empty to which electrons can hop to increase their energy. So this is called a band insulator. Completely full band. band insulator. Now what you find uh, quite often uh, is uh, a situation where there are two relevant bands. One band is completely filled and the other band is completely empty. So uh, in a real solid you may have many more bands but the the highest one that is filled completely would be called the valence band, and the one above is the conduction band. So um, why are they called like that? Um, and by the way, if you're thinking about cool band names for your band, these were already done, uh, but I've never heard of a band insulator. So maybe this one is still available. Um, well, uh, how would you, uh, so they're called this way because, um, you know, if you had any way of somehow skipping this band gap and populating the conduction band partially, you would create a, a metal. You, you, would, you would make a conductor. And so you could do that uh, if the band gap is not too large. There are ways to do it. So... Uh, if the band gap is large, like several electron volts, uh, then uh, these are just insulators. There is nothing you can do to get particles out of this band into the higher band. But if the band gap is smaller, like one electron volt, for example, uh, then materials uh, are called semiconductors. And that's because this higher band, the conduction band, can be partially populated by some fraction. So it's not half filled, it's not full, it's not empty, but it has a few states filled, like here I show here at the bottom. Uh, some states are filled and you had a little bit of conduction, uh, that's a semiconductor. Now you could hop across the band gap by, for example, absorbing a photon, or sometimes, uh, we will see that later, there are some impurity donor states that can uh, donate electrons here, but this is for later. So this is how you go from being an insulator to semiconductor to a metal. Now if, this, uh, if the number of electrons that you have is so large that you go all the way to half field band here, that is really called a metal. Uh, there could be uh, other situations uh, where it is supposed to be an insulator, but it is a metal. Right? And it's shown here. So, um, for example, imagine that you have two bands like this, your Fermi level is here. And so the bottom band is completely filled, but the second band, for some reason, we don't discuss it now, some more complicated 
terms in the Hamiltonian came further down and became partially occupied. And therefore, well, it could be that uh, you, know, you have some states available in both bands. So this is how it can happen, for example. One scenario is that you start out here with two well-defined bands. And you have just enough uh, electrons to fill this band completely. So this is filled, but the upper one is completely empty. And you are in a situation where you have the valence band and the conduction band, and they're separate. Uh, and uh, however, you increase the interaction between the bands, and they begin to overlap. And so at this point, the upper band just touches the Fermi level in the bottom band, and more states become available. So now, uh, electrons partially occupy both bands. But the spacing between levels increases. The bandwidth grows, but the number of electrons remains the same. And now you have uh, these states in the lower band empty, these states in the higher band occupied. Um, well, for a phase transition has a very clear definition in terms of thermodynamics. There should be some parameter that uh, onsets or uh, jumps. I think this is just a crossover. Okay. From, uh, however, uh, it will be a phase transition from an insulator to a metal. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's possible to write a thermodynamic theory that would describe it as a phase transition. I cannot answer too precisely uh, right now. So, but yes, it will be a phase transition from uh, insulator to metal. But I don't know which kind of phase transition more precisely it's going to be. I know that uh, there can be a phase transition of this kind. Uh, so this is an exotic situation. I just want to highlight it uh, to sort of spark your interests a bit in more complicated uh, physics. Uh, this is something called a moth insulator. So this is the opposite situation where it is supposed to be a metal because here we have a half-filled band. We have one electron per site. It behaves as an insulator, however, because these kind of processes are extremely energy expensive. So you have one electron per site, but to have some kind of conduction, to have some kind of moving, you need to have situations where this electron uh, goes to the neighboring site and you have two electrons per site. And then when there are two on the same site, that costs so much energy that that is actually disallowed. And therefore, these electrons are all stuck on their sites. And by tuning this energy, how much it costs to be on one side or to be uh, together, uh, you can induce a transition from a metal into a mod insulator. And these metal insulator transitions are a subject of a lot of physics. Uh, it's a very, very deep uh, physics behind this. Some of the examples of such materials are these, but there are also some of the recently studied materials like uh, high temperature superconductors, for example, have uh, also mod insulating phases. And therefore, uh, this is a very interesting example. Uh, there are other situations where uh, this simple model that I presented with bands doesn't quite work. For example, one spin uh, does funny things like decides to spontaneously arrange in the same direction, then we need to uh, make corrections to this band model and uh, consider spin. And we are going to do that uh, later in the course. Okay, so in the five minutes remaining, uh, I'm going to show you something cool with Python. Uh, I'm going to tell you that actually uh, these tight binding calculations are not just toy models. Uh, well, or they're toy models, but also in the, in the hands of uh, modern physicists. People keep playing with them for useful things um, and uh, can be generalized to be 
not just one dimensional but two and three dimensional and you can get the band structures of materials like I shown you today but you can also calculate sort of higher level properties where uh, the sites of the model uh, represent not real atoms but just some imaginary sites uh, which could be you know every few atoms there is a site and electrons hop between them so not re actually connected to a real lattice but modeling uh, very deep processes in quantum uh, behavior of electrons uh, in this uh, effective way. So for example, you could uh, imagine that you have a, a system like this where there is a piece of conductor and some leads connected to it. You attach electrons uh, to this piece of conductor and this is how you would represent it by a tight binding uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to go to the level of individual atoms, but you can just say Okay, in this region, I have about 100 sites, and they are connected by hopping J terms, uh, where each of the black lines represents a hopping from one side to the other. Uh, and then you can also model leads as just plane waves. So a plane wave comes in here, and then it begins to hop. It can exit here. It can exit here. It can reflect back. Uh, this is the intuition you would get um, by, okay, in this case you would, may have to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation to look at a particular uh, propagation of a particular electron, or you could uh, get a spectrum of energies uh, in this kind of system. Uh, you would uh, need to express this model in terms of a Hamiltonian like this, but this picture is also a Hamiltonian. This is a pictorial representation of a Hamiltonian where each side ha costs you energy epsilon naught and each hop costs you energy minus J. Uh, and so this is uh, the Hamiltonian of that which includes the Hamiltonian's submatrices of for leads for source, drain, uh, leads and a scattering region uh, like that. So you could calculate conductance in this region, you could calculate um, uh, energy levels in this region and uh, this is a tight binding uh, example from uh, recent uh, research that is relevant to recent research. Um, now some uh, very good people wrote a Python code uh, which uh, just solves this matrix. The matrix I just had on the screen for you, it just takes it, diagonalizes it, finds a spectrum, uh, solves this tight binding model now for some of the practical things, like for example, this code here is, oh, I opened it three times. Hopefully it will still run. Uh, this code here is uh, for a billiard, which is a um, two-dimensional region with a square lattice and uh, looks, like a, like, looks like a stadium, actually. Um, you can vaguely see the uh, red points here. That's the lead. So uh, external waves can come in here, and then they hop along this grid. So this is how the system looks. Um, and this, uh, the next uh, window will show you the wave function that lives in this stadium. So this is the uh, calculation of the amplitudes, the probabilities for the electron of being on different sites, and this is called the quantum chaos. Uh, so this wave function is a uh, chaotic. If I move the lead around, it will change. If I change the energy, so this is for a particular eigenstate, uh, you, can, you can do this kind of things. Um, I just want to show you uh, now, I, th I guess with PowerPoint, um, yeah, you can also model uh, more complicated things like three-dimensional structures with a tight binding hopping between them and different materials represented by different colors, semiconductors, superconductors. You can uh, have a piece of graphene stuck here in between the electrodes. Uh, and this is roughly the amount of code that you need to write to create, for example, such a structure, right? And then if you want to solve for the energy levels, there is a line that says, you know, solve. So the rest of it is already done for you by some smart people in Python. So just download this package and uh, 
you can be calculating tight binding uh, uh, simulations. And um, you know, here is a different shape. You can program in a hexagonal lattice. So something like graphene or molybdenum uh, sulfide would be a hexagonal lattice, and you can simulate that. You can simulate three-dimensional lattices like for real silicon or real diamond uh, system. Uh, and you can do all this with uh, Python. Uh, why am I showing you this? It's because uh, you, know, you guys have totally enough knowledge to perform these simulations. And these simulations often become immediately relevant in real physics research done in a lab right now. So you know, this is an excellent pathway for you to make some contribution. All right, let's stop here.